Hello and welcome to this Astranti pre-scene analysis video series for the November 2019 strategic case study on Courier Organization Run. And this pre-scene series is going to contain nine videos, seven of which are going to be based on this specific pre-scene document. And on top of that, we'll also have the strategic analysis document where we look at the various different models from the SEMA syllabus and how they can be applied to the case and also the top 10 most likely unseen issues. And generally, we're very accurate with our top 10 issues. And over the course of the many different pre-scenes that have been released, the many different exams that have been sat, etc., we generally scored around 70 to 80 percent correct in our most likely issues, with a couple of times we've actually predicted all 10 issues. So before we start, just going to run through the general process for this video series and which videos are going to cover which specific topics. Now, in this first video, we're going to look at an introduction to the role in which we are playing in the organization and also look at the industry, the courier industry, the parcel industry, etc. That's going to be the subject of our first video. Then the second video will look mainly at the market and the changing business environment while also looking at the history of the company that we are working for. The third video will then look at the strategy, the missions of the organization and also the various different costings in the budget analysis. And it's unusual to see a budget in a strategic level precinct. This is usually an operational level topic. But what that does signal to me is that there is perhaps something that the examiner wants you to pick up on. Perhaps they are going well over their budget. Perhaps they need to improve on their systems, improve on their forecasting systems, and perhaps work on reducing costs to ensure that they meet their budgets more effectively. It's unlikely to be tested in a more theoretical way because operational level tested that budget is down in that level. So we are going to be looking at budgeting from a more strategic perspective, as in what can the business do to improve on its budget. The fourth video will then look at the organization structure. So we'll be looking at the board of directors, we'll be looking at the non-executive directors, and we'll be looking at the organizational chart of the company, both at the board level and also the general structure of the organization. The fifth video will then jump over the risk and the financial statements, but we will be coming back to those to look at the various different news stories and the extracts from the driver's blog. Now, there's not that much information usually in the stories, but they are a really good indicator of where the examiner is heading. They're not chock full of information, but they often focus around specific points which the examiner wants you to think about. And therefore, these are often good indicators of the kinds of issues that are going to come up in the exam. And then we'll be returning to our principal strategic risks for the risk video, which is number six, and also the financial statements in the F video, which is video number seven. And in that section, we'll look both at the financial statements of RUN and also the financial statements of one of its leading competitors. And once we have completed our analysis of the specific pre-scene document, we will then go on to video eight and nine, which will be the strategic analysis and the top 10 issues. So before we begin the analysis, I'll just tell you a bit about who I am and also how we are going to go through this video series. So first of all, my name is Peter Steff. I'm the head of strategic case study here at Astranti. I've been teaching the strategic case study since 2016. And prior to that, I taught the management and operational case study. Also heavily involved in writing the various mock exams that we produce for our course and also marking those mocks as well, seeing where students are going right, seeing where they are going wrong. And I use that information to help feedback into my video analysis as well, common mistakes that students make. I've also written several of the free study texts that you can use here at Astranti. So onto the video series itself. 
It's actually we're going to go through the pre-scene section by section, picking out the various key points, various things that are going to be important for your exam. Also look at how real world companies or how companies in this actual industry, obviously it's a fictional company in a fictional industry, fictional country, etc. But there are plenty of parallels with the real world and that's what we will be tying the analysis to. So look at various key business models as well. Some of the things that you will have learnt during your objective test studies, how we can apply some of those models to the case of so SWOT analysis, stakeholder matrices, and so on. We'll also look at likely exam issues that could arise, as in when we're looking through the analysis, are there particular points they keep referring to? Is that a hint on where the examiner is thinking they may take the exam? What previous questions have come up in previous exams when this kind of information has been given and so on. And also just key exam hints and tips as well, things to prepare you for the day, ways in which you can perhaps streamline your information, streamline the information within the pre-scene so that it helps you for the exam. Then look at the strategic analysis, our strategic analysis video, which looks at all the different models, lots of the big models, and applies them directly to the pre-scene. So we'll be looking at where the company is, where the company wants to be, and how it's going to get there using various different theories. And we'll conclude the video series by looking at the top 10 most likely issues. These will be based on previous issues that have come up in previous case studies will also be based on how much weight is given to particular topics to particular things within the pre scene and how this actual series will work is when we're going through it section by section i'm going to assume that we have no prior knowledge as we go through it as in the whole point of this video series should be as if you and i were looking through the videos together or looking through the pre-scene together. So I'm not going to act as if I've read through the entire pre-scene when I'm going through each individual page. We're going to look at it as if we're seeing everything for the first time. So we're not going to be ruling anything out at any particular stage because of what may come later in the pre-scene or what may come later in information given to us by SEMA. We're just going to assume that every single thing is relevant. We're going to assume that every single sentence is the first time that you or I have seen it and we're analyzing it based on its own individual mutually exclusive merits. What I suggest is that you read through a particular section and make notes and then come back to the start of the video and we'll go through it together. And as already mentioned, at the end of the pre-scene analysis, we will then move on to the strategic analysis and top 10 most likely issues, which in a sense summarize everything that we will have done throughout the pre-scene. And as you're making notes on the pre-scene, remember this is the context for which the exam will be based. So there will be a lot of information here that perhaps won't necessarily be relevant in terms of answering the question. They're not going to be testing us on our knowledge of the precinct. They're not going to be testing us on things specifically in the precinct. It is the background information that will give us context when we are answering our questions in the exam. So if they are asking us a question on whether they should go ahead with this particular project and give us some information on that project, we will have background information on the industry, background information on the company that will allow us to pinpoint the suitability of this project based on what we know about the organization. Remember that you shouldn't be rewriting or sorry, pre-writing anything based on the pre-scene. So don't assume that they're going to ask us a question on this. I'm going to write out a mock answer based entirely on this information in the pre-scene and I'm going to ignore anything that comes up in the unseen because remember the unseen is the actual exam. The material given to us in the unseen should take precedence over material in the pre-scene if it contradicts. So don't write anything based on the pre-scene or pre-write anything based on the pre-scene because it is the background information for us to deal with it. It's not the unseen, it's not the exam, it's just the background information. 
But saying that we must use the information in the exam, but we must tie it back to the context of the unseen. And your recommendations must be consistent with strategic analysis. So if when we're going through our strategic analysis and we're looking at suitable projects, we're looking at suitable things for the company to undertake, if your recommendation completely flies in the face of all that analysis, it flies in the face of everything that's in the pre and everything's in the unseen, then you're likely to get marked down because it is not a sensible conclusion. So let's begin the pre seed looking at the first page here, which is a very much an introduction to the pre seed and introduction to the role in which we are playing within the organization. So we run couriers. And a lot of students, they often skip over this page. They jump straight ahead to the organizational chart, to the financial statements, to the risk report, the things that they feel are more tangible in terms of the analysis and what they are going to actually get from it. And I perfectly understand that, but there's actually a lot of very important information in this first page. It may seem very short, but there's a lot of information here which will set the scene for the rest of the pre-scene. So just as the pre-scene is the context for the unseen exam, this first page is very much the context for the rest of the pre-scene. You can see that it starts off by talking about the role that we are playing, that you are playing within the organization. It's very important that you learn this and that you act as if you are a senior manager in the finance function at Run Couriers, because that is ultimately the context in which you are going to be adjudged and graded on in your exam. And Seema has been very clear that they want students to actively play the role that they have given. And there's a lot of information here that relates directly back to the role that you are given by Seema in that preamble to the strategic case study, where it said that you are supposed to be the senior manager advising the board, you need to be taking care of risks, devising strategic options, sourcing financing, and providing recommendations. And we can see that there is material that directly relates to that. So we can see we are reporting to the board. We are advising them on special projects and strategic matters. So very much your E2 and your E3 syllabus comes into play here. Just to note that on E2, yes, this is the strategic case study exam. Generally, most of the content will be tested about the strategic level but certain parts will come in from E2, things like project management, as you can see here. And SEMA does justify this by saying that everything that you would have learnt up to this point is still technically examinable because it is considered to be assumed knowledge. Now, they're not going to base the exams around things from the management and the operational level syllabus, but just be aware that you can bring up material from this level because it is considered to be assumed knowledge. And on top of that, the role that SEMA has given us asks us to consider risks and funding. So those are your key P3 and F3 topics there as well. So as you are reading through the pre-scene, you need to be thinking about the risks and what risks this organization might face. So you can see that it is an international courier company. So right off the bat, we can generally think of a few risks that the company might face. So obviously they are a transport company. So fuel prices are very important here. They are an international company. So regulations, different regulations in different jurisdictions could be a problem as well. There could be certain things that they can do in their home country, in Zealand here, that they can't do in other countries and therefore they may have to adapt their vans, their lorries, whatever it is that they use to transport and whatever they might be transporting as well. It could be perfectly legal to have a certain product in Zealand and it's illegal to have that product in another country and they need to be aware of these sorts of things otherwise it may bring the company into disrepute if it's caught with goods that it shouldn't have in another country. And another risk that I've outlined here 
is environment. These days, there's a lot of talk about the environment. It's, it's certainly been in the news a lot recently. There's a lot being said about combating climate change. And so, of course, a company like this, an international transport organization, is probably going to have a significant impact on the environment. So when we're thinking about our greater business environment, our PESTEL analysis, perhaps that's a, a key e-model that you'll need to be considering as we go through this pre seam We need to think about the damage that this organization is perhaps doing to the environment and how we can offset that. Perhaps we can undertake various different projects that may cost money, but they will offset our carbon footprint and they will also boost our reputation because there's a lot more knowledge about things that damage the environment these days, particularly with the rise of social media, people talking and sharing information about companies, and people want to be seen as using a company that is environmentally friendly because it's very important to a lot of people. So this can actually be a way to benefit the organization because if we can show the public, we can show anyone who we might be dealing with that we are good for the environment, that we are taking steps to reduce our carbon footprint, that may boost our reputation. And Run is based in Geeland, where the currency is the G dollar. Now, see, we've got a currency here, and we also know from the first line that we are an international company, which means that if you see currencies, you see the fact that we're international, we need to think about changes in currencies, the strength of different currencies, exchange rates, and hedging against losses. If we are dealing with a company overseas and they use the C dollar or the D dollar, and the C dollar or the D dollar becomes very strong against the G dollar, then that might impact our ability to operate within that other country. And vice versa, if the G dollar gets very strong against the C or the D dollar, then it may impact companies within those countries and how much they want to deal with run, given that the G dollar is so strong against their home currencies. So there are ways in which we can get around that, though. Again, you're not going to need to do it from a very technical perspective. You're not going to need to revise exactly how you price all your options and your futures contracts and everything, because you were tested at that in P3 and F3. That was the theory exam. Here, it's more about just generally why you would use it from a strategic perspective, a more holistic perspective, how it reduces the risk of loss on currency transactions or currency translations. And there are various techniques you can do that, such as leading or lagging payments to your suppliers or to your buyers, or by simply always invoicing in your home currency or by netting using a bank account set up in those different currencies. So for example, if we had a bank account in the country that uses the D dollar, then that would have less effect on business within that country. Because even if the G dollar was very strong, we could still operate using that bank account within that country using the D dollar. And it also means that we might see that the organization has a currency reserve to combat this. If, if they do have that, then that is a good thing. That's a strength of the organization because it is actively hedging against risks from foreign exchange transactions and translations. It's a large company with a lot of physical assets if it is a delivery company. And therefore, differences in the translation value of assets could have a big impact on its statement of financial position. And GDM requires companies within GLAND to prepare their financial statements in accordance with the international financial reporting standards. And so this is a good thing because it means that it's going to aid the ease of international trade. Because if we're dealing with lots of different countries that all require companies to create their financial statements in accordance with the IFRS, then that's going to make international business a lot easier because then we can unify our different transactions. We can unify our financial statements across the different countries in which we operate. A run is quoted on the Geeland Stock Exchange. So again, when we're thinking about our F3 here, we're thinking about funding, we know we are a quoted company. So we can potentially raise money 
on the stock market, which is always a useful thing to do. And this also helps with just generally running a business. A quoted company feels more prestigious. It feels more safer as well because it is listed on the stock exchange. And because it is more prestigious, because it seems safer, that can also help with recruitment, which is a big risk in the career industry because of the fact that it requires such vast amounts of employees, a lot of manpower, so to speak. And therefore, having something that helps you with recruitment will be beneficial. One of the downsides to this, however, is that once you are a quoted company, you have to do more reporting, you have to prepare more statements, etc. And you can see here that the Geeland Exchange is actually a very well regulated exchange. So in addition to this, though, companies are expected to require or to adhere, sorry, to the Geeland Code of Corporate Governance. Now, governance is very much the way an organization should be run for the best interests of all stakeholders. So it's very good to adhere to the code of governance. And we'll also have to let the shareholders know why we are not adhering to the corporate governance, uh, to the code of governance. And when you see a code of governance within a pre so in this instance, it's the Geeland code of governance. They are generally always based off of the UK code of governance within your syllabus. So as long as you are aware of that UK combined code, you should be able to understand exactly what kinds of governance rules and regulations that run is supposed to adhere to. And the Geeland economy is well developed and based on a mixture of manufacturing and service industries. So Thinking from our pastel analysis, we've got the economy. The economy is strong, the economy is good, and therefore it's likely that there's going to be a lot of people, a lot of organizations that will use our services. And also because they're manufacturing companies, they're likely to require the use of transport companies. If there was too many service industries, for example, if it was nothing but banks and trading firms and financial institutions like that, the chances are they wouldn't need to use courier services a lot because they aren't transporting vast amounts of tangible goods. Employment rates are high, and this is generally a good thing, although perhaps it could potentially be uh, a bad thing for this organization if, for example, they have a lot of problems with retaining staff because if they have problems with retaining staff and they constantly need to hire new people and employment rates are already very, very high, then it becomes harder to do that. You have an easier time bringing on new employees if unemployment rates are higher because there are more people looking for a job. So that ties in here with recruitment, but it also shows that people are likely to have a higher amount of disposable income, particularly given as it goes on to say here, that whilst there is a statutory minimum wage, this isn't just a minimum wage, like a legal minimum wage. The statutory minimum wage is also good enough to be considered a living wage as it provides enough for full-time workers to support themselves and their families. And also a large portion of this working population actually earns significantly more than that minimum wage which means they're going to have a lot of disposable income, which means that they're going to be buying products. So if you think about the fact that a lot of couriers do business to consumer trade, there's going to be a lot of consumers that are purchasing a lot of goods off the internet because they are well off. They have disposable income because the wage that's provided is more than enough to support themselves and their families, particularly given that a lot of people earn more than that. So again, Looking back to the economy, it's a, a well-rounded economy where people do have disposable income. One way in which this may not be so beneficial to the organization is that there will be a culturally ingrained expectation within the country of Geeland of earning a reasonable wage. And therefore, particularly with our sort of business where perhaps the job doesn't require that much skill in terms of uh, you know, stacking in the warehouse or driving a van, etc., but they'll still command a reasonable wage. And if we're a large company, which we are a large international courier company, then we're going to have 
loads of employees, thousands and thousands of employees, all expecting a decent wage, regardless of the level of skill that their job actually requires or the level of skill that they bring to the job. So that could make employment and staffing costs very, very high. So as you can see from this first page of the page that I mentioned that many students might skip over, there's actually a huge amount of information here. We've already identified some key economic aspects that will impact the business, such as the amount of disposable income that people within Geeland will have, also the idea about the general economic state of Geeland and whether they are going to have lots of goods being transported, given that it's a manufacturing industry. We've identified some strengths of the organization that quoted on the stock exchange. This helps them raise money, it also helps with recruitment and security of the organization. They're adhering to the code of governance, or they should be adhering to the code of governance. This is a strength if they are, a weakness if they are not, because the shareholders may turn on the organization if they aren't adhering to it. We've also identified the fact that because they're an international company, they're going to be subject to foreign exchange risk, both in transaction and translation. And just generally what we knew about courier companies, what we know about the general environment, we identified some of these weaknesses or threats up here, looking at fuel prices, regulations in different countries, and also their impact on the environment. But we also looked at some strategies to overcome some of these things. So when we were looking at foreign exchange risk, we were looking at the potential to lead lag payments, use home currencies. When we we're looking at environment, looking at the ways in which they could potentially offset their carbon emissions. And that would also be beneficial from a reputational perspective. So before we move on, just going to look at a few key things that I think are going to be important based on this as we continue to go through the precinct. So I think that looking at risks, particularly with regards to operation, operational risks, thinking about the, the general logistics of running an organization of this size across many different countries, I think that's something that we definitely need to look at. And components of this could be the supply and value chain. Now, again, supply and value chain, usually you find that lower down in the SEMA syllabus, in the operational and the management level. But given the nature of this organization, given the type of company that it is, I do expect that to perhaps be a bit more relevant for this pre-scene than it usually is for the strategic case study. We also need to think about the general strategy of the organization and also think about how it hedges against risks with foreign exchange. On top of that, environment, and I've expanded on this by bringing in political. A, because political is also a key part of your pestel analysis, which for a large organization like this is always going to be relevant. And because of the nature of the impact on the environment and also the costs of the organization. Again, it's going to be a lot of things here with regards to fuel pricing. Um, fuel, oil, etc. is a highly politicized product and there's been lots of issues recently. There's again more potential turmoil in the Middle East and that could really have an impact on oil prices which will also have an impact on fuel prices. So environments here, particularly with regards to fuel costs, it's also a political thing as well as being a pure cost and a pure environmental issue. Also, other key issues facing companies like this these days is with regards to technology. Consumers want more and more information. They want to rely on things arriving exactly when they want. They Not only do they want next day delivery, but they sometimes want specific slots and they want to keep track of their parcels at all times. So integrating all that information onto an online system, onto a cloud system that tracks everything is very important. It's what the consumer expects. And it's one of the key issues facing the, the general transport and courier network industry in the real world. And finally, just put a bit here about staffing and staffing costs, as also expect that to be 
quite relevant. We've already been given some information about pay, we've already been given some information about employment, etc. And just generally what we know about an organization like this means that staff is going to be an issue. So let's move on now and look at the second page which looks at the courier express and parcel industry. So this is not specific to run, but it, it looks at the more general courier industry. And couriers provide delivery services to their clients. So the client is the buyer, the client is the organization that says run, take this parcel and deliver it over here for us. And this generally falls into two categories, two features that are offered by courier organizations. And the first is security and speed. So this is something that we can do better than the businesses themselves can do. They know that when they use our services, it will be secure and it will be quick. So those are also core things that the organization needs to provide. And part of this involves being able to track the products. So again, this ties in with what I was just saying on the first page about IT information management systems, real time cloud management systems to track the parcel where it is at all times. And this helps with security, but it also helps with this guaranteed delivery deadline. So the client knows where their package is and the person or the organization who is receiving the package knows where it is at all time. And actually, people are willing to pay more for a quicker service. But this is something that potentially could be in decline because people are expecting quick delivery now. It's all well and good saying, well, will you pay me extra? I'll give you it next day. Well, because of companies like Amazon and Amazon Prime, etc., offering three next day delivery, it's becoming more and more of an expected thing. And there's actually research that suggests that people will actively not continue with a purchase if they cannot get a dedicated set delivery time that suits them. So that's a big risk in that the general nature and the changing face of the industry requires more and more certainty over delivery time and an expectation of it as well, not just to pay more and you'll get it next day. That's the standard that people want. And that is going to put a big amount of pressure on the delivery companies, particularly as they're not going to be earning more for it, but it could be far more expensive. And also from a logistical perspective to arrange that. If you're thinking of the thousands, hundreds of thousands of parcels they might have to deliver every single day, that puts a lot of pressure on the organization, particularly as they don't have much time to plan because an order might come in that's for next day delivery. So they suddenly get 100,000 new orders and they've got to arrange that for the next day, but they've still got some other things they need to deliver. It becomes very difficult. And some options to help with this, as I mentioned, we're going to be looking through this pre-scene and talking about specific options as that is one of the things that Sina said we needed to look at. So options to deal with this, to improve on this would be to continually invest in information management and information technology systems to ensure we're always at the cutting edge and as efficient as possible. And that will also be what separates us from our competition. An alternative way this can be achieved is by offering a tailored service. So couriers will collect packages from clients as well as delivering. Some couriers offer locations which packages can be dropped off and this may reduce the cost of the service and can be more convenient for some clients. So if you think about times that you perhaps sold things off of eBay and you're going to be delivering it to the person who has purchased it, then you can take your product that you've packaged up to a certain drop off point. Sometimes it's a news agent or a supermarket or something like that, a post office, and they will then come and pick it up. And this is much easier for the organization because they don't have to then come to your house to do it. They can come to the news agents and they've got a big bag worth of parcels to pick up and deliver waiting for them. And as this section continues, it starts to talk more about the kinds of things that we would perhaps be doing here at RUN, the larger courier companies, creating bespoke logistical services for businesses. 
So what this to me represents is almost becoming the outsourced delivery company, not just being a completely separate entity that does some deliveries for a business, but we are in a sense taking on the role of their delivery service, the delivery service within the organization as an outsourced, outsourced company. So as you can see here, saving the business from having its own delivery vehicle. So rather than the company having to have its own fleet of vehicles, we are the outsourced provider of transport and delivery for that organization. That could be much more lucrative than the odd deliveries. So again, we're providing an important service that an organization cannot perhaps provide for itself. But this also brings with it a set of inherent risks because we need to think about the times that we perhaps miss a parcel and how that affects us. It couldn't just, it might not just be the odd delivery that is missed and therefore a certain individual or something is a bit annoyed that they didn't get their product on time. We are in a sense representing an organization or a big client who might be worth millions of G dollars in terms of the outsourced contract that we have with them. And so it puts greater pressure on us to maintain our standards. And a general theme that we can already see here throughout security speed, tailored service, what we know about delivery, what we know about companies like Amazon, etc., is that the, the customer, the consumer is the number one priority. We cannot let the customer down. And this has some negative impacts on the individuals. There's been plenty of stories of people working in Amazon warehouses who were under such pressure to meet delivery quotas and production quotas, etc. But the client, the customer always comes first. And it's really crucial that we maintain our relations with our clients. And also we keep all customers, be they businesses, be they consumers, satisfied because that is what is going to keep the business going. If we do not deliver on time, they will move to a competitor because of the fact that it's becoming more and more critical than ever to meet all these next time, next day delivery quotas. So constantly adhering to the customer's wants and needs and wishes is a critical success factor. And this is throughout all stages in the delivery process as well. So again, thinking back to your value chain, your after sales service will also be very important and um, something that we can add value to differentiate ourselves from the competition. But this doesn't just include physical items. It can also include inventory and digital inventory management. So for example, if we've got very sophisticated systems of monitoring where stock is, stock levels, transport times, and how to move it all around in the most efficient way possible. That could also be a software that we outsource to various different companies as a way of improving the revenue stream. And the pre-scene then gives us an example of perhaps goods being delivered to a manufacturer's dispatch area, then to a certain hub, and then distributed among various different supermarkets. And that would be what we would be planning using our systems and what we would perhaps be then undertaking using our delivery service. But there's also a risk potentially in here that when companies start to get very big, it becomes perhaps more efficient for them to do the deliveries themselves. So this example here of a supermarket, it could be that it is a regional supermarket that has quite a few shops in local areas, but it's not efficient anymore to outsource the delivery. They have enough information, they have enough experience to start doing their own deliveries. And so they start their own fleet service and that's a client that's lost. And then if I go back up here, one of the absolute biggest clients to any delivery service in the world at the moment is Amazon. Amazon delivers a huge amount of goods and a significant proportion of every parcel that is delivered is an Amazon parcel. And Amazon are talking about doing their own delivery services and their own delivery systems. And so that's going to be a, a huge impact. If there is a Amazon-esque company that we are working for, if they are a number one client and they start to do their own deliveries, then that is going to put a huge dent in our 
profits and our revenues because we will have made so much money from them. So there's a few issues to bring up here. So we're thinking about buyer power. A company like Amazon would have a significant amount of buyer power. So we're thinking of our Porter's Five Forces. That's something that will perhaps push the price that we can charge down to that various client, particularly if there's a risk they'll use their own services. If they do use their own services, then it could be a huge issue. We might have to sell a lot of our vans. We might have to lay off our employees because we can't afford them. And that's going to have a, a snowballing effect. Also, what we need to think about here is the increase in automated delivery. Again, using Amazon as the example, because Amazon talking about or they testing using drones. There's also issues in America with uh, Tesla who are creating trucks that are autonomous, that are electric, etc. And are these things that we need to be bringing in? Are these things that we need to be investigating? This could be a risk in terms of could it become more and more efficient for companies like Amazon to do their own deliveries by using these systems? And if it isn't, will we then have to adapt? Will we have to bring on these autonomous delivery vehicles? Will that cause friction amongst our staff? Will they be very expensive if the trucks cost hundreds of thousands of G dollars each? Then that's going to be a huge expense to replace our existing fleet with these new vehicles. So while we're on the subject of that though, that's another key likely issue here is autonomy and driverless vehicles, driverless trucks, driverless vans, and even drones and things like that, because those are things that Amazon are using and potentially gonna have a big impact on our staff who we know are a significant stakeholder in this organization. And courier companies take various different forms. You've got very small local ones within certain areas or multinational ones like Run who operate globally. And local couriers often carve out a niche for themselves, perhaps delivering very small packages to nearby recipients. And we've got an example here of professionals such as lawyers, architects, etc., transporting time-sensitive documents. You know, bike messages, bike couriers that you may have seen on the streets of New York and places like that. And they're very useful because they can move very quickly through city traffic and cities often very congested, etc. So again, potential option here, if we are going to be delivering very small packages, then perhaps we could employ our own bicycle couriers as a way of beating the traffic within local areas because at the moment we're using vans and trucks, etc., and that is of course going to be stuck in traffic. And then you have larger couriers that operate on a national or international basis. That is what run do. And we offer perhaps various different services such as bulk transport, but also maybe very specific point to point services. And the example they've given here is an airline that perhaps requires a very specific part and they pay a courier to collect it from the manufacturer and have it driven immediately to the airport where it's required. And this can often be very expensive because it requires potentially a very, very long trip for a single item. And therefore, likelihood is that it's going to be command a certain price for it. But the client is likely to pay that because they're obviously very desperate. Now, for example, here, you've got an airport and perhaps a plane can't take off without a certain part being replaced. And therefore, the company might lose a lot of money if it can't take off on time. So it's worth paying a huge amount of money for this item to be delivered directly. And most large couriers, so like Run, operate a hub and spoke basis. And this reduces the cost of an inefficiency from point to point sales. So rather than just taking one item from one main point and delivering it to the location, they have this hub system where goods are transported around in mass to certain areas where they can be delivered more effectively. So for example, if you've got an individual and this individual lives over here on the outskirts of City G, 
Now, if you are just using one central location, then you've got to transport it perhaps from all the way over from City Hub A to that one location and then drive all the way back again. And there may not be any other deliveries that you can make on that route. And therefore, it's going to be very expensive to do that. So instead, what they do is they've got an example here, at least, has got several different hubs, the main hub, City A, then separate hubs in B and C, and goods are transported from the main hub to City B, and from City B they are then transported out to City E, they're transported out to City J. And what will be required here is a very informed information system that keeps up to date on the best location for every single item to be. So for example, if all the goods that are going to be transported from an area around City B. So let's say this is the sort of catchment area for everything in City B, and you've got lots of different towns in this box as well. Then any parcel, any delivery that comes in to go into any of those locations, the is then made aware of at the main hub in City A and then just transported to City B and then appropriately transported out to the various different locations. And that minimizes the wasted capacity of vehicles. So ideally a vehicle should be full when it is being transported or it's transporting goods. If that's going to the customer, if that's going to the various different depots, it should always be full. And you can see here then, then go on to essentially discuss something very similar to what I have been saying here. So transports are then made between the different hubs, for example, collected by the City F depot and then delivered or transported locally to the City A hub for sorting. And then it's forwarded on again to the next place. And then the final delivery, which they call here the last mile, is when it is actually delivered to the individual or the organization who is going to collect it. And hub and spoke systems must be managed carefully to ensure that deadlines are met. Customers can choose various time frames ranging from next day to seven day delivery. Goods for the next day must be collected and deposited at the local depot by a cutoff time. And this should allow sufficient time for transportation to the hub sorting and onward transportation. And again, this is something that is becoming more and more transparent because it is something that the client expects. If I order something off of Amazon, I know exactly where it is at all times. I know when it has been dispatched from the main central fulfillment center. I know when it has arrived at the, the hub city in my catchment area. I know when it has been loaded from the hub city to the local distribution center. And then I know when it has left the local distribution center in the van for delivery. And I also know where the driver is. I get notifications saying that your driver is 10 stops away. And I can actually look at a map that tracks the driver, that tracks the van. I know where it is and how many delivery stops they are away from me. And that is going to require a very advanced system. And that's why IT information management, etc., will be likely to be a big issue for an organization like this and therefore a big issue in your pre-scene exam. So as we conclude this video, we've already picked up quite a few points here. We've picked up on various different risks that are going to face the company from fuel prices, from recruitment issues, staffing issues. So again, staff are big stakeholder, clients are very big stakeholder as well because they are ultimately the people that receive the package and the people that choose whether to use this service or not. And if we do not adhere to the highest levels of customer service, we could lose them. We've also looked at foreign exchange risk. We've looked at the strength of the organization, such as being listed on the stock markets and also plenty of future options for them as well. Could they break out into more local career services for very specific small document type items? We've looked at the risks of uh, the main clients starting to use their own delivery services and therefore replacing our outsourced delivery service. And also that 
in this actual industry, in the real world, there's a huge advancement in autonomous and driverless technology and a push towards that, which is something that we will need to consider. So I've summarized a lot of just what I've mentioned there at the bottom of your screen. And this is all material, all information that we're going to continue to build on as we progress through the video series. So please join me for the next one where we will look at the, the breakdown of the market segments within the industry. And we'll also look at some more information about run themselves. So thank you for watching this video. I hope you have enjoyed it. And more importantly, you have found it useful but to finish by just telling you a few things about the products that we produce here at Astranti and the ones that are part of our course. So these materials can all be purchased as part of the course or purchased individually. So we have our study text. We have three study texts for all the objective test exams. So three study texts for E1, P1, F2, F3, etc. But we also have the study text specifically for the case study exams split into two parts. The first is about how to approach the exam, how to analyze the information, how to plan your answers, how to write your answers. And also the second part, which looks at the key theories from the objective test levels that are relevant to the particular case study. So if you are looking at P2, P3, oh, sorry, P2, F2, E2 for the management exam, F3, P3, E3 for the strategic case study exam, and so on. We have our course videos, which look at how to plan your answers, how to manage your time effectively. These are the key reasons why people fail the exam. With our pre-scene analysis, which looks at the pre-scene in a lot of depth, applies key information to that, and also concludes with the strategic analysis, where we look at the various different models in the SEMA syllabus and apply them to the case, and also the top 10 most likely issues to arise in your exam. Generally, we have a 70 to 80% accuracy rate on our top 10 issues, our industry pack, which details in great depth the history and the current contemporary issues within the particular industry that the pre-scene is based on. We also have 20 to 25 industry examples that you can use within your answers. We have mock exams that can be purchased with or without marking and feedback, where you can get some real exam practice in, look for the kinds of things that the examiner is going to bring up in the exam and also get marking and feedback from expert markers who have marked for SEMA and for us for many years who know exactly the kind of things that exactly the kinds of things that the examiner is looking for exactly the kinds of mistakes that students often make and can provide lots of detailed feedback to ensure that you improve on your performance. We also have our master classes, which are two day long classes, which look at all the key issues facing students in the exam. We will also go through live planning, showing you how to plan your answers effectively, how to write your answers effectively. Again, key things that cause people to fail the strategic case study exam or any of the case study exams for that matter. And also, if you do sign up for our course, provided that you have filled out your forms, provided that you have submitted your mocks, provided you have done everything to show that you have really given it your all to try and pass this exam. We also offer a pass guarantee, giving a free reset to anyone who fails the exam.